And no further ado. Well, all right. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me, uh, inviting me to uh, to speak about restoring the Kinnikinnick. Uh, I I assume that you folks are not, since you're not very far from it, uh, a lot of you are going to be familiar with it. But there's been a lot of developments in the in the saga of the dams in the last month, and uh, and I'm glad to talk with you about those and where things are going. Um, uh, a lot of you probably know me. Uh, I just live over in Viroqua and, uh, uh, until last Thursday, I was a, a TU DARE employee and now I'm, uh, retired from that and, uh, flunking retirement already because I'm working as a volunteer, uh, on behalf of the, the new nonprofit that the city of River Falls asked to be formed to help with its, uh, Kinney corridor plan. And I stepped up and I've been a board member of the Kinney Corridor Collaborative as well as a, a TU DARE employee. Uh, and I'm working as a fundraising chair of the, of the Kinney CC. Uh, it's a, it's an, an effort that has uh, a lot of, uh, it, it, it's a river that has, that's awfully dear to a, a lot of TU members and I'm, and I'm one of them. So I'm, I'm glad to be working on it. Uh, I can tell you where my wife and I have spent March and April. Uh, she's uh, running for re-election to the city council as of tomorrow. And uh, we got the door knocking done and the yard signs up. And tomorrow we'll find out whether it was all uh, all for, uh, uh, for a good purpose. Uh, meanwhile, we're both down with colds. So we're really not very much fun. Uh, now, as I said, you folks probably all know the Kinney. It's only 70 miles away from Rochester as the crow flies straight north. Uh, and it's only about 28 miles from, uh, uh, from St. Paul uh, and even less distance from Woodbury uh, for the folks that live in the Twin Cities metro area. So it's no wonder that uh, the, not only the, the Kayaptois chapter with its 350 or so members uh, but also the Twin Cities to you uh, chapter with its 2,000 members, second biggest chapter in TU, is uh, real interested in this river. This is a river that has had many things written about it over the years. Uh, one of the most charming is a book called The Fishing River, uh, which was written by Edith Records Warner uh, back in 1962, and it's about her father, uh, I think his name was Punch Warner, uh, teaching her two sons, his grandsons, to fish on the river. It's an, as I said, it's an absolutely charming book. But you know, if you look to uh, the guys that wrote the first and second, uh, or the Old and New Testaments, uh, Jim Humphreys and and Bill Shogren, they they treated the the Kinney as their home waters, and and Jim. Jim wrote that there's no better place to spend an evening anywhere than on the Kinney uh, on a summer night. And he, he said, it, even though he'd had a chance to fish practically everywhere, he treated it as one of his half dozen favorite uh, waters in the world. And, uh, and he's, he's not the first and probably not the last to, to treat it uh, with a lot of reverence. Uh, of course, our friend Bob White, uh, painted this picture of the lower Kinney down in the canyon uh, with a, uh, an angler that you probably mostly know. Uh, in the original uh, picture, uh, one of the anglers, Golden Retrievers, was standing in the water right next to him, but in the final version, it's uh, turned into a rock. And, you know, uh, it doesn't matter if you catch big fish or small fish in there. The, the Kinney is such an engaging river. Uh, whether you're in the upper 20 miles of it that comes immediately out of a set of huge springs uh, just north of Highway 94, uh, or whether you're down in the, the last six or seven miles of the canyon, uh, it just, it's, a, it's a great place to fish. You can even find uh, Minnesota TU board members and former NLC members and state council chairs down in there once in a while. Uh, it's got the, the crying limestone the, where the drips over the banks and, 
and uh, and forms of stalagmites down the down the hillside. Uh, I got to thank uh, thank uh, John Mowry for that for that picture. Um, and uh, and of course we're going to talk about about dams tonight because that's a key part of restoring the river, and it's been one of my uh, favorite activities to help watch that happen over the last 25 years. And we've lost some, but we've won some. And this is a dam I visited in, in 2001, the Marmot Dam on the Sandy River in Oregon. And at the time, the owner wanted to take it out and sport fishing groups didn't want it taken out, even though it was going to open up uh, many, many miles of salmon spawning habitat sportsmen didn't want to take it out at that time. Uh, it took them five or six years to get through the process and eventually take it out. Uh, and it's there's something just immensely satisfying to me about watching this happen. Uh, most of the time, though, it doesn't happen this way. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, one of the things that we have uh, uh, to guide to guide us as we talk about the dam removals on the Kennecanic River is this picture from 1865 by a photographer named John Corbett. And in all the dam wrestles that I've ever been involved in, I've never had one that had a, a pre-dam photograph of the river uh, before the Kinnikinnik. Um, the the Kinney was, was first settled by European settlers in the in 1846 when uh, uh, Mr. Foster uh, uh, camped out in a cave by the river in the winter of 1846 and 47, along with his indentured uh, black servant. Uh, and, uh, and the next year he and other people started building dams on McKinney. So they didn't dam Junction Falls uh, right away uh, but it has been dammed now for uh, 125 years. At one time or another, there have been about 11 dams on that river, and we're down to two. What we have on this river that, that bisected into the lower and upper Kinney are two dams owned by the city of River Falls, and they're right smack dab in the downtown area of River Falls. Many of you have probably fished below the lower dam, the Powell Falls Dam. This is the one above it that obscures the, uh, the falls that you saw in the preceding slide. Uh, this was built in 1920, but there was an 1880s, 1890s dam that it replaced. Uh, and that 15 acre uh, impoundment is, is at 90%, it's 90% full of sediment, as is the lower impoundment, which is about the same size. This is the Powell Falls Dam. Uh, the present dam was built in the, in the mid 60s to replace one that was built in the mid 30s to replace one that had been blown out by flooding in the mid 30s and had been in place since the 1890s. Now these, are, these dams are both hydroelectric uh, generating dams and they're owned by the River Falls Municipal Utility and they uh, generate combined about one and a half percent of the utilities electricity. The rest is bought on the market. And when you build in maintenance and insurance costs and repair costs, the electricity they get from the dams is more expensive than what they, uh, what they uh, uh, buy on the market. Uh, but uh, this dam is the one that is scheduled for uh, removal. Now, this is an, an aerial layout of the, of the two dams. It, the uh, Junction Falls Dam is at the uh, lower end of the yellow hatched marked uh, portion. And the Powell Falls Dam is almost at the end of the red one. Uh, they, as you can see uh, to the right of the yellow uh, hash marked one, uh, mm -hmm. that's the main street of, of River Falls. And you can see that the, the businesses on Main Street look out over the impounded part of the uh, of the of the river. There's uh, there's very little current uh, behind Main Street at this point, but it should be a free flowing river, and that's one of the aims of the Kenny Corridor Plan is to try and restore that. Uh, this is the uh, the impoundment uh, for the uh, the upper impoundment. 
I remember right. Let's see, I, uh, oh no, this is the this is the lower impoundment. Pardon me. That's formed by the uh, the Powell Falls Dam, uh, and as you can see, it's uh, it's shallow. It's algae filled. It doesn't have any recreational use except by a bunch of geese. Uh, it's sediment and goose poop and and algae, and there's there's no no fix, fishery in it. Uh, the DNR doesn't even bother to survey it because there's there's nothing in it. Uh, one of the one of the things about uh, these dams that has been a, a factor throughout this whole discussion is that they, as generating dams, just like uh, the Hoover Dam or the Glen Canyon Dam or the TBA dams or the dams on the Snake or the Columbia, they're licensed by a federal agency, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And they get these 30 year licenses and, uh, and they have to be renewed. Well, the last time that the licenses were up for renewal was back in the late 1980s. And uh, at that time, the city applied for relicensing, FERC granted it, there was basically no discussion. And, uh, and there were people in the community who said, let's not ever do that again. And as a result of that, the Kayaptoish chapter uh, through Kent Johnson, who was a, spent his career as a water monitor for the Met Council, um, uh, started monitoring the thermal conditions on the river above, between, and below the two dams. And what he found over 30 years of, of data is that the lower river is somewhere in the neighborhood of four and a half to five degrees warmer in the summer uh, than the upper river. And that's uh, in large part caused by the warming, the solar warming of the two impoundments. Uh, the, any water that goes into them gets warmed up and sent downstream. And the result of that is that every year there are more and more uh, near lethal days uh, when the, uh, in the lower river, uh, when even the brown trout there are stressed by high temperatures. And the climate scientists tell us that this river, if, if it's going to be resilient against a, a climate change, is going to need to, need to overcome that uh, that, that, that rising temperature. Another thing that they found was that uh, stormwater runoff during summer storms can spike the temperature as it comes off warm streets and warm parking lots by 10 or 15 degrees in a matter of minutes. Now that eventually goes down, but it's like a death of a thousand cuts for a river. And it's led the city to, to uh, commit uh, to revamping its stormwater uh, system and the removal of these two dams is gonna be able to give them uh, an opportunity to do that. So, so the city applied in 2013 uh, for relicensing the two dams, thinking that it would go through and uh, they'd get their 30 year uh, relicensing and they would, uh, they would go forward without any, any, uh, any problem. But the, that wasn't what happened in January, 2014, uh, hundreds of people showed up at City Hall uh, to, uh, to ask for a different discussion and a different outcome. Uh, and, and over the next four years uh, and dozens of meetings with hundreds and hundreds of people, uh, the Kinney Corridor Committee was formed, an advocacy group called Friends of the Kinney was formed. And eventually, after all this planning and discussion, the city council in February of 2018 approved eventually removal of the dams. First would be Powell Falls and that by 2026. And then they also asked that a new nonprofit be formed. Uh, and that is the uh, Kinney Corridor that I'm volunteering with. Uh, well, you can imagine if you, uh, if you start in 2019 trying to raise money uh, for a, a project uh, that's not going to happen until 2026, uh, as we did, uh, most of the funders that you approach are going to say, great, we like this, come back in 2025. And, and we were basically stalled out. Uh, it was going to be a slow process, a long slog, and it was going to take forever. Well, you know, sometimes good things happen uh, serendipitously. In June of 2020, one of those things happened. Uh, about 10 inches of rain fell in about a half a day, 
and led to flooding through the city and through the corridor. And, and the dams were, the tops of the dams were eight feet under the water levels. And uh, there, was, uh, there was a lot of sediment that was washed downstream and damage uh, to the Powell Falls Dam, where the edge of the dam uh, is attached to the, to the bluff on the uh, river right looking downstream. Uh, that, uh, that wall was damaged and a big chunk of it broke off. Uh, and that led to some serious safety concerns. And uh, the city asked for permission to draw it down, uh, draw down the impoundment so they could look at it. Uh, and, and they got that. And in the fall of 20, it was drawn down. And the inspection showed significant damage that was going to be expensive to repair. And the city council decided not to repair. Well, it was an interesting situation because at that point, it still would have taken on the FERC schedule five years, five more years to get rid of the dam. So we suggested to the city council and the city council requested to FERC uh, to uh, allow the city to light, surrender the license and allow the Wisconsin DNR to take over oversight. That would also open an opportunity for, for some funding that they, I think they had not thought might be available. And that was if you own a dam in Wisconsin, you want to take it out, the DNR will give you $50,000 to take it out. But if you own a, if you're a municipality and you own a dam, at that time, you could get $400,000. Uh, well, that sounded a lot better to the city council. But the problem was no, uh, no dam that was eligible for that program if it had a federal license. So I suggested to the city and the city agreed that surrendering the license would be a way to open up more funding. Well, then what happened was our, our Democratic governor proposed that that municipal dam removal grant program uh, be increased from a maximum of $400,000 a project to a maximum of a million dollars a project. And so your TU partners raised $5,000 in a week to hire with the Wisconsin TU lobbyist uh, to take this on and see if we could get it through the legislature. Well, it was an interesting challenge because we had, as I said, a, dem a Democratic governor proposing to a Republican legislature that they increase funding for this program. They were, he was also asking that it be increased from uh, 2 million a year to 5 million a year. Well, everybody that we talked to told us it was a really, really long shot, but uh, I guess us TU folks were too na naive to know it was impossible. And so we, we shanghaied members of the Joint Finance Committee and every legislator in Western Wisconsin. And we, we stalked the, uh, the halls of the Capitol with the TU lobbyists and the Wisconsin TU folks. And lo and behold, oh, and the local legislators, both Republicans were supportive of it. And lo and behold, the increase passed. So now we have a million dollar cap instead of a $400,000 cap. Well, this is what the impoundment looked like after the drawdown in uh, about four months after the drawdown in March of 2021. As you go from the from uh, right to le lower left, um, you can see that the, this area was all formerly impounded. Uh, and you can see that the uh, in the middle, it's already started to cut its new channel. And as it got down toward the, toward the dam, it was about, the banks are about 10 to 12 feet high. Uh, this is what it looked like uh, just about two months ago. Chris Young of, or Chris O'Brien from uh, TCTU was down there fishing and caught fish and took a picture of the, the banks. You can see the surface level of the sediment in the impoundment is almost as high as the dam. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, accumulated sediment. And when the planning was going on, the engineers figured that there would have to be about 46,000 cubic yards of sediment removed, or, or at least moved out to the perimeter or some other source. And as we slope those banks back and, and stabilize the channel, uh, but it was also estimated that in the flooding in June of 20, um, a, uh, 
about 15,000 yards went over the top of the dam and downstream. And it was also estimated that when the dam was drawn down, another 8,000 yards went downstream. So for the first time in a hundred and some years, the lower river is not sediment starved. Now that may mean that there's also <laughs> more shallows <coughs> and shoals than there might've been uh, two years ago. Uh, but it's, uh, uh, it also means that we're probably gonna have to move less sediment uh, with heavy equipment than we originally thought. And I'm looking forward to some happy surprises in that regard. The, the end, of, uh, end of February, the federal uh, license was canceled. And the next day, the DNR, Wisconsin DNR took over supervision and the city applied for its dam removal permit. And the next day, the city applied for its $1 million municipal dam removal grant. So a lot has happened just in the last uh, five weeks. You can see, you can see here what the uh, the river looks like going uh, through the powerhouse now that it's been drawn down. Uh, in the last month, the turbine has been removed from the powerhouse uh, to allow uh, more water to go down in case we get into a high water event. There's a there's a, a certain amount of concern about that. Uh, because if you get uh, two or three or four inches of rain in a short period, you can have some refill of that uh, impoundment. And what you really don't want is uh, re-wetting of that sediment, uh, because that means that it's going to have to dry out again before you can get the heavy equipment in there to move it. So last summer, uh, which was really a drought period and didn't really have any big rains, uh, we held our breath. And this summer, we're going to be holding our breath, too. Uh, the, the other interesting impact of the, uh, the drawdown that was found in temperature monitoring last summer and fall was that already the uh, temperature in the lower river uh, has cooled by a little more than three degrees so that we got three degrees off that warming impact. Uh, and that, that says... Uh, uh, if we can get this one out and keep it out, that water will be cooler. And that if we can get, it suggests that if we can get it out and get the second one out, the water will still be even cooler. Now, there's a, a couple of aspects to that that are real interesting. I'll show you in a minute. If you look here, this is a, this is a view looking uh, from the northeast to the, or northwest to the southeast across the river, just below the Junction Falls Dam. And what you can see on your lower right are one of two spring ponds that flow into the river there. And if you look across the river, you can see the, the white water, and that is a, the, the falls of the South Fork of the Kinnikinnick, which comes in from, oh, several miles off to the east along Highway 29. It's clear and cold and brook trout water, and then it drops over a cataract. And you can just see the, the swing bridge across the river, across the South Fork in the upper left corner of the picture. But you know, what's happened for decades and decades and decades is the water from those springs and the water from the South Fork have flowed into the upper end of the impoundment. And guess what? They get warmed right up. But now with the impoundment gone, there's no more of that solar heating going on. And and the, those two waters are coming in cold and they're staying cold and going on down past the Powell Falls Dam and into the lower river. So that's been a boon to the, uh, to the fishery and a, a protective event. And uh, it's, it's pretty exciting to watch it happen. Uh, there's another view of the spring ponds. Uh, there's one on the very right and then another one uh, closer to the river. Uh, and you can see there's a whole little drainage area in there. Uh, I'm, I'm excited. I think there are more springs along the base of that ridge that are going to be going in too. Uh, and one more look at that. So the key to, to this all has been temperature impact. And that's another feature of this dam removal discussion in River Falls that was uh, really unique. It had you know, a lot of dam discussions hinge on a lot of things. Sometimes they hinge on emotion or Sometimes they, a lot of times they hinge on the economics. Uh, but 
underpinning this discussion was 30 years of temperature data. It was good science done very professionally and, and, uh, and reviewed by, by other scientists, peers. And there was no doubt of what the scientific impact or what the scientific measures of the impact of these dams were on the Kinnikinnick. And that gave that civic discussion a tone that is really rare in, in, uh, in my experience in, in dam removals. Uh, it was a, I think it was a crucial factor. And going forward, it's gonna, I think it's going to continue to be a crucial factor. Uh, one of the things that is built into the uh, the budget for, for this part of the project uh, is a, a continued monitoring plan, not just, not just temperature and invertebrates, but a, but a broader monitoring plan measuring turbidity and dissolved oxygen, water chemistry and other features. Uh, and, and that's going to be uh, important going forward because it's going to equip, equip us better uh, to, when we get into the discussion about how soon and, and how to remove the, the upper dam. Uh, it should strengthen the uh, case. And the other thing I think where it's valuable is that it will give people in other uh, dam removal uh, situations, potential dam removal discussions, uh, uh, a really well-developed uh, well, uh, scientific measurement uh, of what the impacts are when you take a dam out uh, so that people can be a lot better, better informed going into the, into the discussions in other communities. Uh, these are, these are uh, uh, illustrations of the places that the monitoring stations will be in place. But if we can do this monitoring program as proposed for 10, 10 years from, uh, from last summer, uh, then, uh, then we should have a good uh, evaluation of this river pre, during, and post dams. So, so I bet you're sitting there asking, what can we do to help the Kinney? Well, there are plenty of events that are going to be going on, and and the more people that show up for those, uh, the the better off uh, the community will be. And and to have us there to discuss dam removals and and uh, to point out that there is life after a dam removal would be valuable to a lot of folks. Um, we can help with monitoring, volunteers are needed for that. And I can give you contact information with that. And then money, Lord knows we need money. Uh, how much money you might ask? I bet you were just thinking that. Well, we put together a, a budget for this uh, that talks about the, uh, the basic costs of dam removal, uh, dam demolition and removal of the debris, uh, restoration of the corridor and the management of that sediment, uh, and then and then the monitoring itself. Uh, the the Kinney Corridor Plan, which you can find on the city's website, calls for um, a subsequent phase to uh, turn that former impoundment into parkland and prairies and wetlands and paths, trails and landings and an educational facility uh, and shelters and bathrooms and that sort of thing. Um, but we're, ours is, uh, this phase that we're working on is, is uh, dam removal light. Uh, and, and the goal is to raise uh, a $3.3 million budget uh, to, uh, to by the end of this year uh, to take out the dam and get the restoration of the corridor done and get the monitoring underway. And then eventually we'll move on to the city's uh, parkland development stuff and its stormwater management stuff. And then we'll move on to the next dam. Uh, no, no date has been set for the second dam removal, uh, but uh, it, you know a good goal would be to try and get it out in another five years after we complete this one. Uh, the, right now, what do we have? We have a $3.3 million budget, but the city has committed $1.2 million, and the DNR dam grant is asking for another million from the DNR. Uh, and if we, uh, if we have help from the, the DNR's trout habitat crew to do the corridor restoration, uh, that might be another $100,000 of inland trout stamp money. So that leaves us faced with raising a million dollars uh, between now and the end of this year. If that happens, 
we're going to be in a position where we can, uh, where the city can have its contractors uh, build a causeway in around the edge of the former impoundment to the dam and uh, get the heavy equipment in to demolish the dam and then take the pieces out. And then next winter, while the, while the soil is frozen, uh, to get that heavy equipment working to move the sediment that still needs to be moved around the impoundment. Uh, right now, we have just a really vibrant uh, fundraising committee. And I have to give credit to the many TU members from uh, Kayaptowish and Twin Cities to you that are working on it. And they've split up the task into a number of uh, a number of uh, uh, pie slices, uh, and they're going to be working on all those areas. The goal for the for uh, for TU contribution to this is uh, is two hundred thousand dollars out of that million. And I have to say that uh, with uh, support from uh, Kayaptowish. They've already pledged or contributed 75,000 and the Twin Cities to you uh, initial uh, goal was for the, the, the board uh, committed uh, $15,000 to match 15,000 from uh, Twin Cities to you members and supporters. And they're well on the way to that. So a big chunk of the $100,000 that's already been put together is, has come from TU. Uh, but there are there are good opportunities out there in the world of business, individuals, foundations, and other governmental organizations. So we're uh, we're uh, cautiously optimistic, and I don't think it's unrealistic to think that we're going to be able to do it. But it sure would be nice to to be able to um, to have other TU chapters across the across the Midwest uh, supporting too. Uh, we've already had uh, support from one of your neighboring chapters in Minnesota and from uh, two chapters of, of uh, th with a third expected in Illinois. Uh, so we expect that uh, most of the Illinois chapters are gonna be chipping in and we're gonna ask uh, all the Wisconsin chapters to donate as well. Um, so there are lots of ways to do this. Uh, one of the best ways might be to send it to TCTU and let them match it. <laughs> donate it through the Twin Cities to you uh, site, but there are other ways to do it. You can do it through the Kinney Corridor Fund. Uh, you can do it uh, through uh, Kayaptowish or Twin Cities to you, uh, or you can do it through the, uh, the Lower St. Croix Valley Foundation. Uh, I'm sorry, just the St. Croix Valley Foundation. They all have mechanisms set up to to help donate, uh, to make it really easy to donate to the Kinney. Um, I'm, I'm really, really excited about TU's involvement in this because uh, TU members were some of the strongest advocates for this removal when the discussion was going on. And now, now people like the city council are saying, well, guys, come on, you, you were in, all in favor of this. Now it's time to put up or shut up. And, uh, and I think TU is doing pretty well at this. Uh, there are a lot of a lot of different uh, potential sources of support here, uh, and and we're uh, we're exploring a lot of them. But we'd welcome suggestions for other places that we might uh, that we might uh, contact people. And in this kind of a situation, uh, you know, there are a lot of foundations in the world. But the best way to work with a foundation is to find somebody who's associated with a foundation who. Uh, is interested in inviting you to have a conversation with them. So if you happen to know somebody like that, uh, or if you happen to know an employer that, uh, that supports their employees' contributions, uh, that'd be another good way to, to go about it. Let us know. Um, so I'm not going to be able to show you the video, but you can kind of get a sense of, of what's down there now from this picture from last summer uh, of the area just above the Powell Falls Dam. Uh, you know, this is just one of the one of the prettiest rivers that you could come across just about anywhere. And there's no reason that or there, it's a good reason that 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 people love it so much. Uh, it's meant so much to an awful lot of people. Uh, and I think, you know, if we think about as a, uh, as the tribes do, if we think of seven generations ahead, you know, maybe not a lot of people are going to remember uh, names of people that worked on this and 
uh, but they're going to remember that this was uh, changed from a dammed up uh, a dammed up river to a free flowing river, and that helped it to uh, endure. And I think that's one of the things about the Kinney; it is an enduring river. So uh, that's probably all I have to say, although that's not a certainty. Uh, but if anybody has any questions. I have to give uh, Jeff Green credit for this great picture. Uh, but if anybody has any questions, I'm glad to answer them. I haven't seen any come up in the chat. In fact, I don't know where my chat window went. Um, I got a question. I got a question from the, Carl's got one here. Oh, sure. Um, the dam that, that's going to be removed, is that the lower dam or the upper dam? The lower dam comes out first. Yep. Okay. Correct? Yes. The one that flooded out. Which, yes. It's probably, well, it might good. be the most impactful one. Yeah. Um, I've only briefly <coughs> been in River Falls, but what we saw in... Um, except for one lady from Iowa, uh, when we did our project in uh, Preston. And part of that stream restoration project in Preston was take out a whole boatload of trees and actually give Preston a view of the river that runs through their backyards. Um, is there an opportunity to, to actually reconnect River Falls with the river that runs? Yes. Through there? Yes, it, and, and that's a really good point because uh, Communities that have used their rivers for uh, industrial uses and dumping sites over the years kind of have trouble uh, turning their gaze to the river instead of to Main Street. And in River Falls, it's a perfect opportunity for a, a river walk and uh, trails and a sort of a, a reestablishing of people's visual contact with the river and, and their ability to, to walk along it. So there's a whole portion of the plan that calls for um, for the development of um, pedestrian and biker friendly walks along the river and businesses that face out toward the river. Uh, there's some just some really uh, some sites just waiting to be occupied. Um, but and that takes some time. You know, when I moved to uh, I, I discovered the Kinney in 1988 when I moved from Madison to uh, Minneapolis to take a job with a law firm that started to explode the day I walked through the door. I don't think it was my fault, but it was a miserable, it was a miserable time. And, uh, and I often said I spent a decade over there one year uh, before I moved over to Eau Claire and formed a new firm and practiced there for 20 more years. Uh, but my respite during that year was, was on, on the Kinney. And, uh, and it, it has a place in my heart because of that. But when I moved to Eau Claire in 1989, um, they were having a debate about what they should do with the Eau Claire and the Chippewa Rivers, which had long been industrial sinks and, and the place that the city dumped its sewage in the 60s and the, the same as in the Kinney and, and the Minnesota, and the Mississippi. Uh, but people were moving to clean with the, in the aftermath of the Clean Water Act, a lot of that stuff started to get cleaned up. And, and then the attitude started to change about those rivers. And the old timers still said, oh, why would you want to have paths and trails and stuff along the river? They're just garbage dumps. And it took people not taking that as gospel uh, for uh, the city and its residents to commit to cleaning it up. And now the rivers in, in Eau Claire are vibrant and well used and an economic, uh, an economic boom. Uh, and on any given day, you can see in the summer, you might see 1500 uh, tubers floating down the river. And then they walk back up and they do it again. And they buy some more beer on the way. And uh, so it takes a while for a community to adapt its thinking. And it's going to take that in, in River Falls as we go forward. Uh, they, none of these communities have ever had a, a dam removed in their community before. It's not part of their experience. So we took, took, them, we took a, an effort uh, in the height of COVID 
to go visit other communities where dams have been removed. And you might think of uh, Cannon Falls, uh, but we, we went to uh, Merrill, where the last dam on the, on the Prairie River was removed, to uh, Colfax between Menominee and Eau Claire, where the, uh, the only dam on the on 18 Mile Creek, just above where it goes in the Red Cedar was removed. And then down to Baraboo, where the four dams in that city on the Baraboo River were removed. And it, it was, it, it's been about 15 years since the fourth, fourth one came out in Baraboo, but the city is turning its gaze that way. The new city hall overlooks the river. There are new condos being built. There's a distillery and a, and a great restaurant there. There's a a three mile bike and hiking path along that river that the Kawan has built. And it's a marvelous civic institution, uh, just a, a civic asset. People are out there every day of the year. They, in the winter, they, they get their, uh, their lunch in a, in a bag and they go sit in their car and they watch the river as they eat lunch. Maybe they're working at a law firm like I was. Uh, but, uh, but the way that affects the life and the view of a community is just profound. Uh, in, in Merrill, uh, the, the, the dam on the Prairie River was, was very controversial. And the paper mill that owned it wanted to take it out because they didn't even make paper there anymore. They didn't need the electricity. And uh, residents of the city said, oh, no, you got to keep it at any cost. And, uh, and except they didn't want to pay any cost. Uh, and, and so it was finally taken out. And they turned that impoundment into this incredible prairie park with uh, the birding is phenomenal, and the and the uh, the even the the butterflies and the moths in there are just astonishing. It's a it's a beautiful place, a beautiful park, uh, and 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 it's such a such a wonderful asset to that community. I don't think in another generation anybody's ever going to have any any longing to go back to the you know the twelve inch deep mud flat that was there before. Um, well, so, so these communities have got to, uh, they got to learn it. Those, those interviews are on the kinneycc.org, uh, Facebook page, uh, and you, our YouTube site and, and they're fun, they're fun to watch. Okay. Well, you know, we also have a deal in Minnesota here where if you got a trout, a trout stream running through your town, we have a fall season from October 15th through January 1st, um, you could, mm -hmm. if Wisconsin were to adopt something like that, you could fish in downtown uh, River Falls. It, that's true. This is the this, this is the only exceptional resource or outstanding resource water in the state that flows through a town of more than ten thousand, uh, and it's and and it's likely to be all trout water through there. So, so that's that's that leads to a couple of the questions that are in the chat. Um, one was about the from Charles Phelps about the Upper Kinney and how its water temperature has changed um, over the last whatever recorded history we have. Mm -hmm. uh, it's my understanding that that there has not been uh, that much change in the in the temperatures on the Upper River. It it has been a brook trout river. And it, it and it has been spring fed all along the way. I I, I can't remember the exact amount of uh, gallons per minute that are coming out of those springs at the upper end, but they're somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty five to thirty five thousand gallons a minute. Now I, I could be I don't think I'm really far off on that on that recollection, uh, but uh, but it it has been brook trout water up in the upper end and. Uh, and, and as you get closer to town, it's brook and brown water. Uh, and, and I haven't heard anything that suggests that that has uh, had the kind of temperature threats uh, that the lower, lower Kenny does. Okay. Uh, and the next question was about uh, size structure. The upper Kenny has smaller fish and the lower Kenny has big fish, bigger fish. Mm -hmm. um, do you think, <laughs> will there be any changes that would read? You know, well, it, it changed uh, the size structure in the lower Kinney. Well, there's some there's some interesting aspects to that. the The upper river has somewhere in the neighborhood of seven thousand naturally reproducing brooks and browns per mile, and I would say that maybe eighty percent are browns and and uh, and the rest are brooks. And 
it's all natural reproduction. There hasn't been a stock stocking in there since about 1974, if I remember right. Uh, so the, and, and yes, those fish are smaller. Uh, you know, I think, uh, a 14 inch fish on the upper Kinney is, is, uh, quite trophy like, uh, the lower river, uh, has roughly 3000 fish per mile. It's, uh, almost exclusively, uh, brown trout, uh, in that, in that part of the river. And they are significant, significantly larger. Um, although, and, and I've been trying like crazy to, to figure out a way that, there, that we could uh, get scientists to get behind a, the idea that uh, the, the lower river would have more brook trout with cooler temperatures. But until they have something empirical, they're not willing to say that. Uh, so, so going back to your question, Bob, um, do, you, do you still think, the, do you think the lower river will still support larger fish or is it there a chance of flowably less and it'll become a stream with smaller fish? I, I don't think the flows are gonna change. Uh, although there's a, there's a chance that over time, the groundwater recharge in the upper river is going to be challenged by more development in St. Croix County. As you go out along the I-94 corridor, you're going to have more straws in that aquifer and it might deplete the flows from the springs. And if that's the case, uh, maybe there will be less water. Uh, but the I I think the lower river, if the temperatures are adequate, will still support larger fish. Uh, and but I, I also think that with three or four little spawning trips, real cold water spawning trips in the lower river, there are going to be some brook trout in there uh, that are that may have a little better chance, but a lot of them will still end up being fodder for big ones. So so no, I don't think the the lower river is going to be um is going to be uh, unable to support larger fish that's a place you're going to find 20 inch fish uh or maybe more um there's also not going to be a lot of communication uh the, if if the dam is out if the upper dam is out there's still a 35 foot uh set of cataracts there and and fish are not going to get up there uh, even though fish might be washed down. So there's always, there's always room to recharge the population downstream, but not necessarily uh, get any of those lower fish upstream. And the same thing with the South Fork. Uh, and in the case of the South Fork, that's good because the South Fork remains a brook trout stream. And I'd love to see it stay that way. Okay. Another question from back, sir. Uh purpose with uh, flood control with the dam originally um, in terms of mm. like downstream development? Is no, that no, those have, those have always been run of the river uh, dams and run that way. Uh, and, uh, and it's especially uh, strongly illustrated with the, the, um, the sediment having filled up both those impoundments so much, there's, there's just no, no more storage capacity in either of them. Even so, if you would had warning and drew, drew them down, there wouldn't be any anywhere to add water. Right. Yep. Yep. Very little water in there. Well, we're kind of going through just a few blocks from where we're at here. There's a dam that the city is starting to talk about taking out here in uh, Rochester, the Silver Lake Dam they're talking about decommissioning and taking out. Mm -hmm. Is that a generating dam? Stuart feels a bit it maybe years ago. I don't think it generates anything. It's not very. It's not that big a downstream. It generates. Yeah, the one down on uh, Lake Zumbro. And they took the one out uh, at uh, Orinoco Lake Street. Was yeah, well, it's kind of taken up. Yeah, yeah. we've lost yeah. a couple nearby from floods. Yeah, on the road on the North Fork of the Zumbro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What well, and who owns the dam on, in uh, in Rochester? I believe the city owns it. Uh -huh. um, you know, we, so we have a lake that people yeah. walk around, but it's, and there's, you know, a rowing club that rows on it, but it has absolutely no other sporting use. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know, just just thinking about the the, the health of the river and river function, uh, they they uh, you you can you can discuss river function and get people to think about how you know rivers normally transport sediment and they and they uh, they mitigate uh, flooding and uh, but uh, and and dams. Uh, just interrupt all of that river function. And I think it probably also comes down to uh, the economics. You know, what does it cost to maintain and insure and repair and what benefit do you get for that? And, uh, and, and you often have people that are saying uh, they're trying to re rely on the aesthetics. And I've tried to, tried to rely on uh, 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 the idea that there would be a, a much healthier fishery in a particular river. Uh, and that kind of gets uh, balanced out by uh, the old codger that says, me and the missus have been watching the sunsets across Golden Pond for 53 years now, and you're not going to take that away from us for a few brook trout, you know. And uh, But the, it, it, you can almost say that the economics come first. Uh, and, and then in the case of the Kinney, there was a, there was, there was science to say, uh, to show that there are deleterious impacts and, and you were always going to have them until you got rid of the dams. And that, that was an important part of this thing. The economics can also, and this is an interesting challenge in, in the case of the Kinney, the economics can also, uh, be used to support what can be there after the benefits to businesses and the community of visitors and people that want to come live in a place with a beautiful river instead of two skunky goose goose poop filled impoundments. Um, and that can be seen as an economic benefit, but there aren't a ton of uh, uh, site specific economic impact surveys out there that measure the effect, the economic impact of particular amenities on communities. We did our, uh, driftless area surveys twice in 28 and 2008 and 2017, I think, uh, that each showed a billion dollar impact annually of uh, recreational angling across the driftless. But when you start to, um, uh, to do a, a microscopic view of one community and one fishery or just one recreational amenity, then it's an interesting challenge. And I've, I've, I've been trying for years to track down uh, a, a statement that uh, as of 10 years ago, the Red Cedar bike trail near, from Menominee down to the Chippewa River was worth about $10 million or $5 million a year to, uh, to Menominee. But I can't find anybody who actually took that survey or made that estimate. So, uh, you know, back in my newspaper days, sometimes we said, we heard an editor say, well, sometimes a story is too good to be over verified. And you had to go with you had to go with what you had. I don't know if if, if that's making John smile or groan. Yes. <laughs> well, you also have waterfalls underneath those those impoundments. And you know, instead of watching sunsets, people are going to be taking, you know, prom pictures and mm -hmm. having summer picnics and Doing all sorts of stuff in front of yeah. Think of think, think of many drive, uh, falls. People drive a long ways to go to a waterfall. Yep. You see yep. a skunky impoundment all over the place in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Sorry, a flowage. Three flowage. three thousand five hundred small dams in the state still. Uh, oh, there's a good question. Did you say who to donate to? Uh, you can donate to uh, kinneycc.org. There's a donate button on there on our site. There's one, uh, Twin Cities TU and uh, Kayaptowish both have buttons on their sites. If we had a site, we'd have a button. Well, you can, you can sure story. borrow. You can sure borrow Kinney CC anytime. Well, so, it's, it's, yep. it's a long process getting our donate name back. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. um turnover would be bad um well any other more questions for Duke? all right then i guess thank you Duke, and uh hope to see you on the stream soon sound sounds good i i hope that'll happen soon uh, after the election
thanks thanks for having me it's really been a treat hi to everybody welcome. good luck at uh to crystal tomorrow in the election thank you i'll let her are know her. are we rooting for her or against her hey rooting for her rooting okay. for her. Okay. remember vote vote early and vote often <laughs> good advice okay thank you yeah. too you bet